Over the past seven years, we've watched a lot of movies on this show, and I have a question for you. If you could own any prop from any of the movies, which one would you choose? Now, it has to be a hand prop, mm -hmm. so you can't pick a vehicle, because we would all pick the DeLorean from Back to the Future 2. Uh, I would have to go with some Harryhausen. Wanji. <laughs> a little toy, movable guy. Well, I would love to have a Zatoichi cane sword. Yeah. But I think I would have to go with Janet Gaynor's Oscar. Because not only was it a real Oscar that she brought in to use as a prop in the movie A Star is Born, but it's also the first Oscar. To eBay! I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Here in The Basement, we continue into the future with Sci-Fi July. How you feeling, Craig? You feeling hungry? Well, this movie might just make you lose your appetite because we are watching Soylent Green. I had a feeling this would show up someday on Blu-ray. What does that mean? Soylent Teal. Released in 1973 and probably the most spoiled film in cinema history, Soylent Green was directed by Richard Fleischer, son of legendary animator Max Fleischer, and stars Lee Taylor Young, Joseph Cotton, and Basement alums Charlton Heston, Chuck Connors, and Edward G. Robinson. Man. This was Robinson's 101st film role and his final. Is this the end of Robinson? This is loosely based on the 1966 sci-fi novel Make Room, Make Room by Harry Harrison, who when asked if he was pleased with the film responded, I would say 50%. I think most writers would be happy with 50%. Time magazine referred to Soylent Green as intermittently interesting. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I'm looking forward to parts of the next two hours. Soylent Green would go on to receive the 1973 Saturn and Nebula Awards for Best Science Fiction Film of the Year. So this is this year's 1973 movie. That's right. Yeah, we seem to do one every year. Let's check the Variety Sci-Fi Guide to see what they say about Soylent Green. 1973, let's see what I can find out. Of a population sci-fi actioner with Charlton Heston. Strong production, weaker story. Exploitable. <laughs> Variety. You know how to write a headline. As this movie will teach us, Soylent Green is very bad. But Green is good. It's never too early to start teaching your son or yourself about sustainable energy. With the Enviro Battery. So this is some way to uh, keep the lights on in case the lights go out, it looks like. Yeah. I can stick a fork into an apple and make a small clockwork. <laughs> It's great. Well, strap on your bib and belly up to the buffet because we are about to gorge ourselves with some Soylent Green. Soylent Green's a movie! Why is that lion yelling at me? The world used to be a simple place where there was room enough for everybody, but then the population kept growing and growing and growing until in 2022, everything is overcrowded. Stock photos, the movie. Not enough room, not enough food. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for green waves of Soylent. Soylent Green, it's definitely not people, viewer. Detective Thorne is a cop. He lives with his buddy Saul Roth, and they work together for the police. Remember, Tuesday is Soylent Green Day. Every day is Soylent Green Day when the Lord lives in your heart. <laughs> they try to figure out some... Some murders that have happened recently. What about Zolidnikov? Well, give me time, will you? You've been telling me that for the last three days. Are these guys roommates or co-workers or father and son or all three? <laughs> and margarine's turned. Turned communist. <laughs> Saul talks about the old days. Why, in my day, you could buy meat anywhere. Eggs they had. Real butter. I remember how it was. It was four years ago before Pruitt's EPA ruined everything. <laughs> He's riding an Enviro battery. Yeah. Pretty sick of you. Yes, but you love me. Are they lovers? <laughs> Two men meet for a crowbar hookup. Meanwhile, William Simonson, a rich man, has just bought a gift for Cheryl. She's not his wife. She's not his girlfriend. She is a piece of furniture to be used by whoever currently occupies the apartment. All right, I think I found the prop that I actually want. <laughs> he also has a bodyguard named Tab Fielding. Tab and Cheryl go off to do some shopping. That's a dinner for 12 in the world of Soylent Green. 
While she's out, the crowbar guy climbs into the property. Damn you, you stupid Trump wall. You're the one who caused all this trouble. <laughs> the president got his wall and he just kept building it. <laughs> Snaking all around the United States. He sneaks into the apartment. I should never have upset Charles Foster Kane. He gives Simonson a strangely coded message. They were sorry, but that you had become unreliable. So they sent me, Mike Berbiglia. Oh and then he beats him to death. Thorne gets put on the Simonson case. What was your name again? Charles. Charles what? Foster Kane. I got him. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> when you need someone to play a prissy bureaucrat in the 70s, you cast that guy. Thorne goes to the apartment and he marches around like he owns the place. Eyes the merchandise, if you were. Thorne is very happy to be in this apartment. There's running water. There's soap. Do you have any ice cream? Do you mind if I lay down here for a while? I want to get in the, really, the shoes of the victim. <laughs> and also, do you have his shoes? Because it looks like we were about the same height. Actually, he had suits. <laughs> and there's stuff to loot. Hey, Simonson's not using it. Dear Mom, enjoying my time here in the city. I've got my own stare. This is horrible. That banister is so loose. Saul, guess what? I got food. Like this. And this. And... <gasps> This. A hunk of meat. Oh my god. It's cows. Beef is cows. <laughs> Saul's also given the gift of two large books. 2015 to 2019. Hey, that's where we live. Do you know how many books were published in this country once upon a time? When there was paper and power and presses that worked and... I'll shut up about paper now. <laughs> Thorne and Saul sit down to a nice dinner, which they haven't had in a long time or perhaps even ever. This is like that scene in Tom Jones, but sexier. <laughs> I haven't eaten like this in years. With my mouth. <laughs> Normally I just put it right through the belly hole. <laughs> hey guys, I stole some soap. Thorne is checking in with his superior officer, Lieutenant Hatcher. Soylent Green Day. Do you have the time to <laughs> eat late. some Soylent Green? Let's see, Squalor, 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 Robinson. Thorne is suspicious of Simonson's bodyguard, Tab. He goes to keep tabs on Tab. He stops by Tab's apartment. What may I do for you, sir? I'm here to pry that gun from your cold, dead hands. <laughs> Police! Just a minute! She should have done that porter speech from Macbeth. Yeah. Here's a knocking indeed. <laughs> Sorry to make such a racket. I just really need to pound a lot, even though you knew I was here. There he talks to his piece of furniture, Martha Phillips. Really a nice place you got here. I live with an old man. <laughs> Little suspicions going on here. That spoon has some sort of food product on it that perhaps shouldn't be there. Thorn steals the spoon. What was on that spoon? Strawberries. Strawberries are real expensive. How could a bodyguard afford strawberries? There must be something else going on. Cheryl and some of the other furniture girls are having a party. Why aren't they all playing that video game? Thorn shows up. I had a few more questions I wanted to ask you. You? Come on in the bedroom. I want to do bed stuff. Perfume. <laughs> While they're getting undressed, he asks her more questions about Simonson. This is all part of the investigation. He took me to church. Hosier was there. <laughs> <laughs> he and Cheryl start to get busy, but meanwhile, Charlie barges in and raises hell. These girls are violating their regulations. Thorne uses his authority to intimidate Charlie. Don't you believe me, Charlie? If it was a party, they'd be playing the video game. Get out there, shorty. Stop roughing up these ladies. Cheryl is very impressed, and she seems to be falling for him. You don't have to go home tonight. You can stay here with me. Where there's drinks and air conditioning and a nice hot shower. I haven't had a... Bad. Yeah, I noticed when we were naked together. You were quite pungent. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna burn my bed as soon as you're gone. <laughs> you turn that air conditioner on. All the way. All the way up. When you turn on the air conditioner, it's no good unless you turn on the air conditioner. All the way. No, don't take the shower. Take the shower. They shower first. They shower and they laugh. <laughs> 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 Simonson was always going to church, 
and there was this priest that he would go and say confession to. So Thorne goes and visits him at the mission. I left in a shower today. How are you guys doing? The priest is in rough shape, mentally. A rich man. He's gone too far, but it really doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> you see, this priest heard Simonson's confessions, and he doesn't like him one bit. Closing the Simonson case. What the hell you say? What are you talking about? Simonson was a big shot. It turns out he works for the Soylent Corporation. He's friends with the governor. Why wouldn't we be investigating this guy? Something stinks here. And it isn't me. I just had a long shower. <laughs> just close the case. Classic 70s cop move. Governor Santini, who has his own trees, hears about and fears about the news. Just do what you have to do. Tab goes to confession, and there's the priest who knows too much, and Tab makes certain that he won't talk. Bam. Hatcher is mad at Thorne and puts him on riot patrol. That's the worst duty a cop can pull. Down at the food market, they're selling the Soylent Green. Tuesday is Soylent Green Day, don't you know? People start to get upset because there's not enough of it. This crowd will blow. I know. This crowd totally blows. Yeah. This is the police. Sing Roxanne! Wrapped around my finger! They riot. We're gonna trash this trash. The scoops are on their way. The scoops arrive to scoop up the rioters. Just scoop them right up. Whee! Yippee! Whoopty scoopty, as they say. Meanwhile, the same guy who killed Simonson, now he's trying to shoot Thorn with a gun. Thorn gets shot in the leg, and then he gets smushed by a dump truck bucket. Thorne goes back to Tab's house, and they get into a fist fight together. I don't remember why. Oh. In my soylent groin. Get off my back. He goes back to Cheryl's house. She bandages him up. I like you. I don't like like you, but I like you. <laughs> the Supreme Exchange. Exchange your books, why don't you, babe? <laughs> Give us your books, why don't you, babe? Uh, where old people work with paper media. Saul finds out some things at the book exchange that he doesn't like at all. And he's had enough of this world. He goes down to be euthanized. It's a nice place. They make you real comfortable. I've never had a threesome before. <laughs> Thorne finds the note. He rushes down to the facility. He wants to talk to his friend one last time. Grind, 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 grind. <laughs> he looks like a little Charles Bukowski. They show you pretty pictures. It's gorgeous. They they bring out the Vivaldi. They bring out the stock footage. Fishy, fish. Find the fish. <laughs> and they have a tearful goodbye. But before he dies, Saul tells Thorn what he learned. And then they wheel you off and dump you in a truck. Today they're dearly departed. Tomorrow they're part of a nutritious breakfast. <laughs> Thorn sneaks onto one of the waste disposal trucks and he goes to the plant where they dump the dead bodies. <laughs> Factories are singing all the time. Investigating, investigating. Come on, get to the quote. And they also make the Soylent Green there. Hmm, that's odd. Yeah, well, while I'm here. <laughs> yeah. He puts it together. Bad news, people. He doesn't have the look of someone who's about to shout something iconic. He's being chased by a bunch of goons. Oh, Connors. Who would win, the rifleman or the head of the NRA? <laughs> <laughs> No way, they're both riflemen. The last remaining goon is hot on the trail of blood. They have a fight in the church. They're shooting and punching. Thorn gets shot a bunch of times. Fielding's about to get him. Let me get nice and close to you <clears throat> before I shoot you with this ranged weapon. When Thorn gets him. <laughs> the cops arrive. You gotta know what's going on. Tell the world. Soylent Green is made out of people. <laughs> oh, God. I disagree. I think Soylent Green is made out of pure flavor. The edible substance known as Soylent Green is composed of human remains. I think that's what the quote is, right? No. Soylent Green is people! Close enough. Wait, if we're watching this right now... Uh-oh. That means that we're... Soylent Green. Thank you for wearing an appropriately colored shirt. Hey, I had no idea. Time Magazine hit the nail on the head. Intermittently interesting. <laughs> Perfectly describes this movie. And yet, 
I expected it to be a lot worse. I thought it was going to be a lot more boring. I thought it was more interesting than not interesting. That they went full bore with what is worst case scenario future. There's not a frame in the movie that isn't demonstrating that. The bleakness outside, the haze that's constantly in the air, or the ultra-modern sanitary cleanliness of Simonson's apartment. Where women are furniture. Yes. The thing about this movie is that it's been reduced to a punchline. It's reduced to the punchline of the movie, the big twist ending. The movie is about man's ravaging of the environment. Yeah. It's more concerned with overpopulation than we are now. But we're definitely still concerned about climate change now, or at least yeah. rational people are. As we are destroying the environment, we are inevitably destroying ourselves. Yes. Has Heston, at least in the first half of the movie, has he have played a character that sleazy before? He just seems like, I'm taking what's mine all yeah. the time. Yeah, you know? yeah. And they really demonstrate that the hero of the movie is as desperate as everyone else by showing that he's a thief who uses women to his advantage because he can. If it wasn't for the fact that the movie opens up with him having a genial conversation with a friendly, likable old man, right. you'd have no reason to like him until well into the movie, if at all. Actually, yeah, I didn't even think about that until now, that Saul is a humanizing element, not just for Detective Thorne, but for the world. Right. If he's still there, it's going to be okay. Well, speaking of Edward G. Robinson, apparently he and Charlton Heston were very close on the, on the set, and as he was with the rest of the cast and crew, and they all knew that he was dying. He died before the film was released. He really? died like 10 days after shooting wrapped. Charlton Heston said that during Saul's death scene, all those emotions were really real mm. because it was actually happening. Yeah, my God. So the video game, Computer Space, mm -hmm. apparently that's a real game and it might have even been the first arcade game the people who designed that game went on to make pong if you think about it simonson is the hero of the movie explain he is the only person in a seat of power that we know about who is trying to reveal the truth he's the only person powerful enough to save the world that thorn has to go through all this stuff and hopefully his final cry in the movie is enough to get the masses off their asses but simonson gets the ball running. He's also the only person in the movie who seems to be a good man. He treats his furniture like a girlfriend. Yes, he treats his concubine like a girlfriend. Let's use that term. It feels so... I'm just I, using the terms know, of the movie. I know, but just see, I, I know. I've been using it too. It feels so dirty. I wonder, is his revelation really going to change anything? When you have people who are destitute, they probably would say, it's people? Well... Gotta eat something. There's nothing else to eat. And so that when people start knowingly doing it, that's when it really becomes frightful. As he yeah. says, Next thing they'll be breeding us like cattle for food. And also, this is a world that has no more ideals. Mm -hmm. You know, these things like, it's bad to eat people. This world doesn't care about that. Yeah, yeah. Do we ever see anyone eat Soylent Green? Uh, what are those squares? Is that like eating a cracker? Yeah, it's just protein crackers. Do you cook it? I think you just eat it. I don't know. They don't have soil green recipes. If they gave us a recipe, we'd be like, ugh. Getting hungry watching this movie. Another thing I learned is that soylent is supposed to imply soy and lentils. And there is a product that's out now called soylent. There is. Do you have any more observations on Charlton Heston, the actor? I just don't like him as an actor. It's not anything personal against him. Everything's big with him. I'm chewing. I'm breathing. And then you have him next to Edward G. Robinson, who's just being subtle. That was a nice uh, turn when he sees the beef mm -hmm. and he starts crying and you think, oh, he's, he's crying because he he's never, you know, hasn't seen beef. And he's crying because he's in awe of the beef. How do we come to this? That's a really nice uh, turn for an actor and for a scene. It's a movie that's very much of its time, but it doesn't feel like it's aged that much, and it's still something that speaks to us today. The themes of it are just as important, if not more important, than it was back then. Soylent Green. We have taken it in. Not literally. Good for us. We watched it, and if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. I didn't want to myself, but it turned out to be a pretty good movie. And now, seen it. Seen it. Well, it's Sci-Fi July, so I think you can probably guess what our scenic theme is. Haunted Past writes, Spaceballs. I've never found it funny when I was a kid, so I thought maybe now that I'm older I will understand the jokes. It's not funny as people claim it. Spaceball does have its th 
Three moments. I don't know what that means either. I don't, seen it. Seen it. Did not like this movie when it came out. There not at all. Two scenes in it that I thought were funny and everything else. The only thing I thought was funny was Pizza the Hut. To me, what was funny was when they accidentally kill uh, the lighting guy when they're doing the... Uh... Right. That movie should be so good. Star Wars, parody, Mel Brooks, John Candy. Here is the problem. I think Mel Brooks loved westerns, and he made Blazing Saddles. I know he loved old Universal movies, and he made... Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein. He made Silent Movie. Silent Movie. He loves Hitchcock. He made mm -hmm. High Anxiety. Yeah, but does he love Star Wars? Well, that is a golden rule of parody, that mm -hmm. you parody the things that you love. Aiden Zeus Will writes, Blade Runner 2049 was likely my favorite film of the year. Floor being every possible way. It wormed my way into my head and stayed there. I think it's a modern classic. Seen it. Not seen it. Not yet, at least. Blade Runner 2049 is the gold standard of production design. All the textures of every set and every set piece, you can just feel it. Mm -hmm. The real problem with the movie is that it's a bit dull. And now a lot of people said the same thing about Blade Runner True. back in the day. The problem with this is that it's 47 minutes longer than the original Blade Runner. Wow, that's and, really long. And Harrison and, Ford it, shows up. Any of the other old timers in it? Sean Young is in it. Sean Young is uh, Edward James Olmos. No. Edward James Olmos in the first one is kind of like the Boba Fett of Blade Runner. He just kind of <laughs> lurks in the background. He has a couple important lines. And you're like, who's that guy? Sure, I'd like yeah. to see a movie with that guy. These days, whenever I talk about or think about Ryan Gosling, inevitably I think about his greatest acting triumph, and that is a little film called Papyrus, which he did on <laughs> SNL. I've watched this thing. I must have watched it ten times. It's so good. And when I say it's his greatest acting thing, I'm not being facetious. He brings so much emotion and pain to that character, yeah. and he's not playing it for laughs, and it's hilarious. Jeffrey writes... I actually really liked Alien Resurrection. Have you seen it? No, I haven't seen it. This is by the French filmmaker Jean-Pierre Jeunet, mm -hmm. who did The City of Lost Children. I remember how beautifully shot it is. There are certain moments that just have stuck with me through the years. The aliens swimming in pursuit of, the, of our heroes. The problem with it is crap dialogue and bad acting, even from people like Ron Perlman. And Winona Ryder. Their acting is just terrible. You're reveling in these sumptuous visuals, and then you're slapping your head every time someone talks. Ocean Sage writes, The first movie I ever saw as a little kid was Steven Spielberg's E.T. I watched it in my best friend's basement. I distinctly remember him turning off the lights because, quote, I heard this was sad, so we will not see each other cry in the dark. That... It's a hell of a memory. <laughs> and wow, I'm getting a little choked up just thinking about yeah. it. Seen it. Seen it, yeah. Haven't seen it for decades. Neither have I. Well, now I can't watch it. I have to wait a few years to watch it, to watch it with Lorenzo. Sure. Read Roger Ebert's Great Movies Review of E.T. Because he talks about watching it with his grandson mm -hmm. and just feeling it through a child. It really bums me out that Spielberg went back and diddled with it. He covered up guns and stupid things like that. Yeah. It's totally unnecessary. Yes, yes. You, you want to see the guns because now you know that your little friend is in peril. Oh, God, I cannot wait to watch it again. Did that lose Best Picture to, was it Out of Africa? No, uh, 82, Gandhi. 82 is that big year for sci-fi. You could argue that 82 is the greatest year for movies ever. From the thing to Tootsie and everything in between. And the only movie I haven't seen from that year is Gandhi. Which <laughs> never, won Best Picture. I've never seen that either. They showed it to us in social studies class. And they were probably Gandhi? doing a study on you. What, Gandhi or E.T.? Gandhi. Oh. They told us to take notes because we were supposed to learn note taking, which was a really stupid thing to have to do during a feature film. We do that every single episode, Tona. <laughs> Maybe you'd be sitting on this side if you would have taken the notes. <laughs> <laughs> you should crowd on over to our website, welcome to the basement show.com, where there is no shortage of episodes That's of our right. show. They're all there, and there's also PayPal donation buttons where you can click on them and make a rolling or a one time monthly donation to support this show. And we appreciate it when you do it. Donors such as Joy, who says, Please could you wish Ian a very happy birthday with lots of love from Joy and Luna, the cat. Happy birthday, Ian. From Joy and Luna the cat. And from us here in the basement. Yeah, yeah, happy birthday. 
She also says XXX. I'm not sure if those kisses are for you or for me. Or just like triple X. We were supposed to say really <laughs> sexy and hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> to find out who the rest of our donors are and to see the contents of our mail crate, you can watch our other show, which is called Unboxing, and that's coming up this coming Friday. Soylent Green is done. I hope that's not what we have in store for our future, but it was a good movie anyway. And now, watch this. Is that... That's that's a, Dick, Dick Van Patten. Dick Van Patten. Yeah. A full twenty minutes. Oh, certainly. You don't need twenty minutes. Eight is enough. <laughs> I've I'm never. Le- I'm leaving you hanging. I, I've never wanted to give you a high five before this moment, Matt. <laughs> I will accept the hanging. Remember, Tuesday is Soylent Green Day.